Right. So when when we did when we did our overview of the Krebs cycle, I told you it was either eight or it was seven reactions. It is it is eight reactions in the Krebs cycle. There were ten in glycolysis 2.0. There are only eight in Krebs cycle 2.0. So there's less for you to know. So wait, can you say that again? Yeah, so we did got Colossus 2.0 on Monday, right? And there were 10 reactions. And so you had to know 11 total materials, 11 total molecules, because 10 products plus the original reactant. And you had to know 10 enzymes. Okay? This one, there are only eight reactions, so it's less, right? Less. That's how that works. <laughs> yeah, that is how it works. There's no pyruvate oxidation 2.0 that we are fully satisfied. There's also no fermentation 2.0. We're fully satisfied with that as well. So after pyruvate oxidation, what do we have? Somebody remind me. Katie. Krebs cycle. We do have the Krebs cycle, but what molecule yes. do we have at the end of pyruvate oxidation that goes into the Krebs cycle? Carrie. Two acetyl-CoA. Yes, so we have two molecules of acetyl-CoA. Wait, what are we talking about right now? Are we, we are talking about Krebs cycle 2.0. Krebs cycle 2.0. You don't need to go find the Krebs cycle part in your notes and put this there. Just create this its, its own little place to live, you know? Oh my gosh, Rick. Trinity, why do you look so sad? Yeah. Don't be sad. Nobody should be sad. This is, this is magical. This is magical right now. All right, so acetyl-CoA, how many carbons are in this molecule, in this acetyl group? There are four total among the two, but each one only has two. And that's why during pyruvate oxidation, when we take pyruvate, a three carbon molecule, we lose a carbon dioxide, right? And we get to acetyl-CoA, a two carbon containing molecule. Let me, let me just put that here, just so you remember, okay? So we lose a carbon dioxide off of that pyruvate during pyruvate oxidation. We've got acetyl-CoA. This also explains why this is the most common place for proteins to enter into respiration. And why is that? What is it about those two carbons in acetyl-CoA that make this the most common place proteins enter into the process? How many carbons are there in an amino acid if there's no carbon in the R group? Two. Two. How many carbons are there in acetyl-CoA? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's perfect, right? No? Yeah. I mean, it's not Monday. You guys, give me something, right? I, I gave you Monday because it was Monday and it was cold and wet, but this morning it wasn't even raining. Yes, not, it was. It's still cold. It's still it's still wet. Wet. It is cold and it is wet, but it was not raining. It okay. What else? What other fuel molecule comes in most commonly here if it's used as a fuel in respiration? It is the most energy dense of all of our biomolecules. Rick? HP? Nope, the most energy dense of all of our biomolecules. Lydia? Uh, the, fat. the fat. And specifically from those fatty acid tails, two carbons at a time, right? Uh, Getting converted into acetyl-CoA and then coming into here. Is it all coming back? Yes. Yeah, okay. Right there. All right. So reaction one. So reaction one. We'll, we'll put a little one here because this is reaction one. The first reaction of Krebs cycle. Yeah. So in reaction one. All right, let me do this. Let me make that arrow a little bit nicer. There we go. So in reaction one, acetyl-CoA is attached to a molecule called exaloacetate. How do you remember all this? I don't know. <laughs> well, remember, I, I put two things wrong on the board on Monday, so I, I didn't remember. It for. 90% all the time. So here we have acetyl, oh, it's way more than 98%, by the way. <laughs> That's such a discredit to my... 99.9. Thank you. Like, no. I've, I've made I've made probably 10 mistakes on the board three of which I think you've caught seven of which I've caught but how many things have I written on the board 
I don't know. We we need to break this down. Anyways, so our first reaction attaches acetyl CoA to a molecule called oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. Oh man, put my parentheses in the wrong place. Four carbon molecule. Okay, and so we form how many carbons in this molecule we're going to form. If we take something that's got two carbons and we attach it to something that's got four carbons, what is four plus two? Yes, oh, okay. That's so good. And so we make something called citrate. Okay, and this is a six carbon molecule. Gosh, I'm putting my parentheses in the wrong place. Six carbon molecule. Yeah. I'm confused how what how the oxalon that word Exaloacetate? Yeah. It, like is the, is it the enzyme that makes it happen? No, it's not the enzyme that makes it happen. It's a four carbon molecule that this gets attached to. And you'll see this is why this ends up being a ring, because when you finish the Krebs cycle, you're left with exaloacetate. And then it, it gets used in further. Because this acetyl-CoA is not just, you know, wrapping around in a ring. This is formed by pyruvate oxidation, right? That's more of like a linear production. But you'll see when we get to the end of the Krebs cycle, we end up with exaloacetate. Reaction 8 restores exaloacetate to be used once again in the next Krebs cycle, which again is why we tend to use a circle uh, to reference this. Alright? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. But I'll give you the enzyme that does catalyze this. The, the enzyme is not exaloacetate. The enzyme is called aconitase. Oh. Okay? So there's one reaction. How many are there in the Krebs cycle? Eight. So we are 12.5% of the way done with the Krebs cycle. Okay? So the main thing that happens here is just beginning the process, taking what we produced by glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation and putting it into the next step. Because ultimately, what, what happens during the Krebs cycle? Go back in your notes to our overview of Krebs cycle and what do we make in this process? We make... Oh, oh. 4 CO2, 2 COA... So four molecules of carbon dioxide. <coughs> two molecules of CoA that can be used to make more acetyl CoA. Absolutely. Two ATP. Two ATP, that's good. Six NADHs. Six NADHs. And two FADH2. And two FADH2. And how many ATP <laughs> is each NADH worth? Do you remember that? One or two point five. Two point five. So if we make six of them, that's worth how many ATP? Six times two point five. Anyone? Uh, Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. So we're making the equivalent of 15 ATP by making NADH during this process. I can't believe all this happened in the cell. I know. And it happens just hundreds of millions of times every second. That's crazy. All right. So step two. Reaction two, we go from a six carbon molecule to another six carbon molecule called isocitrate. This is still six carbon. What is this iso? Have we seen this word before? Um, I have. It means same, but we see it with isomers. Isopropyl, nice. Isopropyl alcohol, <laughs> isomer, isotonic. And so it's the same chemical formula, but it's, it's structured. It has a different geometry. Are yeah. we going in a circle here? We are going to go in a circle. So should we go in a circle or not? Uh, you don't need to. You can do it linear. That's fine. You're just going to find if you do it linear, the last part of what we generate in reaction eight is going to be back to here. And then so in your mind, you'll maybe feel a little bit like a circle, even though it's a straight line. Because, okay. you know, you could turn a circle into a straight line, right? You just you just break it and stretch it out. Nothing, Emma. I thought that was pretty good. You gave me less than nothing. You gave me like a, Anger. Watch my face. Yeah. <sighs> okay. 
The enzyme that catalyzes this is called isocitrate. Let me synthase. One of them is synthetase, and the other one's synthase. I want to make sure I got that right. So this is isocitrate synthase. When you see synthase, what do you think? Synthesize or to make, and we are making isocitrate. Oh, it's just, it's just wonderful. Let me, oh, let me move this. Okay, now we're a quarter of the way through Krebs cycle 2.0. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. All right. Reaction three. Bless you. And I'm going to actually give you the enzyme. Yes. Isocitrate? No, the ACO. Oh, aconitase? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the isocitrate. Citrate synthase? Well, what's that difference? Uh, those are those are enzymes. Those are the enzymes that are catalyzing these reactions. The reaction is converting citrate into isocitrate, but the, the it's catalyzed by this enzyme. So remember, enzymes are not used up by the reaction. They do not change the thermodynamics of the reaction, but they lower the activation energy and make the reactions happen more quickly at a rate that's conducive to life. So I'm going to give you the name of this enzyme first so that then you can make some predictions on what's going to happen. Not what the name of the product's going to be because you, you'll never get that unless you know it. But as far as what are some other things that we're going to make. So the enzyme that catalyzes this is called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Have we seen dehydrogenase before in an enzyme? That sounds very familiar. We saw it in glycolysis, and it was triose phosphate dehydrogenase. And what do dehydrogenase enzymes do exactly, Emma? Facilitate redox. They facilitate redox reactions. Which, what happens during a redox reaction? Something gets reduced, something gets oxidized. Something loses electrons, something gains electrons. In glycolysis, what gained electrons and acted as what we call an electron carrier to take those electrons to the oxidative phosphorylation? Anyone remember? Yeah, Emma. Well, well those, so those were, the G3P did get oxidized, absolutely. It lost electrons, but something else gained them. Something that takes their electrons and donates them in oxidative phosphorylation. Where do the electrons and the hydrogen come from in oxidative phosphorylation? Somebody remember. Remember or look on your sheet of paper. Where do they come from? It comes from the thing that we wonder how many ATP is this worth? Lydia. NADH. So NADH is the electron carrier from glycolysis, and we know in the Krebs cycle we need to make six of these things, right? Right? Okay. So we've got to make six of these things, yeah. It's an electron carrier. So it carries electrons from some process into oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so during this, we are going to make a molecule called alpha keto glutamate. Glutamate? Alpha keto glutamate. Yeah, I think it's glutamate. Alpha keto glutamate. Glutarate? Glutamate. Glutamate. Yeah, that's the product of reaction three, but also another product of reaction three is we're gonna take NAD plus and we're going to make NADH just like we did in glycolysis when we stripped electrons away from G3P we put them onto NAD plus cool. so that NADH can take the electrons where? Kyle, what's another name for oxidative phosphorylation? Oxfos. Well yeah, oxyphos but 
the electron transport chain, right? That's, that's, that's Tori's thing, yes. No, that's not Tori's thing, that's your thing. Tori's thing is uh, kinase. Yeah. I like how people have things. Yeah. I'm just... that's, I know, last night was a big night. The day after a big night, it's... Yeah, he had you, yeah. Man. yeah, we want it over time. All right. Okay. You know what else we produce in this reaction? So we convert NAD plus in it into NADH. We also release a carbon dioxide. Okay. And we'll put, uh, since we started with two acetyl CoA's, right? We brought two of them into this process. All of this needs to be two. So it's two exaloacetates. It's two citrates. It's two isocitrates, it's two of these, it's two of these, it's two of these. Sorry if you didn't have room for that too, but it doesn't take up much space to pop that two in there. Tori. How come uh, you tend to wait to the last minute to add the two rather than just starting with? Like, does that have something to do with, like, showing us how the reaction works? Well, because I forgot that I had started with two of these instead of just with one. Okay. So that, that's, that, was, that was a mistake. It was not intentional. Yeah. Sometimes I wait to add the two in there. Actually, it's pretty much always because I forgot it. And then I, I got to remember. Effect. That's right. It's kind of like, oh, never mind. I was going to say something mean, but sorry. I'll save it. I'll save it for a time where you guys are in a better mood. Was it directed towards someone specific? Uh, yes, towards someone who's not here but is related to me and contains about 50% of my genetic markers statistically. Yes. All right. So we've got reaction four. And again, in this one, I'm going to give you the name of the enzyme, and then you're going to predict for me what it's actually going to produce. So reaction four, the, this enzyme is called alpha Keto glutamate dehydrogenase. I know these are fun. I these two point sessions. I mean these are these are good stuff. What does that say? Alpha keto glutamate dehydrogenase. Okay, that's fine. Okay, and, and you're not going to be able to predict the product of this in, unless you already know it. But you should be able to predict what else we're going to make during this reaction. What else are we going to make? What do dehydrogenase enzymes do, Emma? They do facilitate redox reactions. And what happens during redox reactions? Yeah, we are going to make NADH here. During redox reactions, electrons are stripped away from something and added to something else. In this case, they are stripped away from alpha ketoglutamate, and they are added to NAD plus to produce NADH. And so now we've made four of the six NADH we know we're going to make during the Krebs cycle. Tori. Is the ketoglutamate that two as well? It is. Yeah, there's a two here. No, the one, I mean, the, the newer one. Oh, this one? Yeah, I mean, it could be the same enzyme that catalyzes both reactions, or it could be a separate, I mean, it's the same enzyme, but it could be the same individual, but yeah, we don't know. This one is now a five carbon molecule. Sorry, we didn't account for that, but we lost one carbon dioxide, so we've got a five carbon molecule. All right, and this, in this reaction, we also produce two carbon dioxide. And so we are going to produce a new molecule that has how many carbons? Uh, four. Four. So this was, this is six, right, six carbons. We lose a carbon dioxide from each of them, producing two five carbon containing molecules. Then this loses a carbon dioxide from each of them. Five minus one is four. And this particular four carbon molecule, you're going to like this one. Succinyl-CoA. 
So that's the product here, succinyl-CoA, and it is a four carbon molecule. How many carbons were here? Four. How many carbons are here? Four. We added two from where? From our acetyl-CoA. We have now gotten rid of all of the carbons from our original sugar molecule. We lost two of the six during pyruvate oxidation, and then we lose the remaining four of the six during this first half of the Krebs cycle. Now all of our carbons from our original glucose, they're all gone. Well, I mean, they're not gone. They're now carbon dioxide, and if you exhale them, the trees are drinking that up, you know? <laughs> I know. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how many more reactions do I need? This is only four. Gosh, am I going to be able to fit four no, over to here? No, I've been, and I've been five right there. This is going to be a very strangely shaped circle. I'm going to have to bubble this out. You know what? Okay, reaction five. I'm sorry about my circle, everyone. All right. So in reaction five, we make a molecule called succinate or succinate. And this is still a four carbon molecule. And it is catalyzed by a reaction, and this, the name of this enzyme makes zero sense. But what does one of them do? So. Well, I mean, isocitrate dehydrogenase, you carry out a redox reaction on isocitrate. That makes perfect sense, right? Yeah, right. And then alpha ketoglutamate. I mean, the names are long, <laughs> but the names make sense. This one is called succinyl CoA. Whoa. Not a lowercase a. CoA synthetase. But we're making succinate. So maybe this name means that you're taking succinyl CoA to make something with the synthetase instead of synthase. I don't know. That one frustrates me. Because I see synthetase and I want to make succinyl CoA in that reaction, but it's actually the reactant of that reaction. That one frustrates me a little bit. During this reaction, we also make two ATP. Okay, during this reaction, we make two ATP. How many ATP do we make during the Krebs cycle? Two. Uh, two. two. So and there, there, we're done with those. That's pretty nifty. After only reaction five. Reaction five, we move back up to I know. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it work. You got this. Yeah, I do got this. You're right. You are so right. Are we ready for reaction six? Yeah. Now we're five divided by eight, whatever percent that is of the way through. What would that be? Fifty? No, sixty-two point five. Yeah. Sixty-two point five percent of the way. Six. Reaction six takes succinate and makes a molecule called fumarate. Fumarate. Check this out. The name of this enzyme, succinate dehydrogenase. And what do dehydrogenase enzymes do, Emma? Dehydrate. Wow, well, I can't. Keep going. Sorry. Well, somebody just fell out of their chair. <laughs> they heard dehydrogenase enzymes. Yeah. What do they do? They facilitate redox reactions. And what are redox reactions? Electrons are taken from something and put onto something else. Yeah. 
You that would be a good prediction, but this one, because remember, we also make a different molecule that's only worth 1.5 ATP during the Krebs cycle. 1.5. FADH2. So during this reaction, we also take FAD and we convert it into FADH2. And we make two of those. Wait, so down there at the bottom on four? You go from 2 NADH plus 2 to NADH? Yes. Yep. You bet. And remember, each of these is carrying two electrons. So NADH is carrying two electrons. It started positively charged. What's the charge on an electron? Negative, right? Yep. And so it gained two negative charges, which would take it from positive 1 to negative 1, but it also gained a positively charged hydrogen, right? So that's why it has zero charge. FAD starts with zero charge. It gains two electrons, which should make it negative two, right? Unless it also gained two positively charged hydrogens. Then it's neutral. Okay. Oh, we're totally going to make this fit. Now I've only got two more reactions that I have to do. Is the last reaction supposed to meet with 2 acetyl or 2 oxalo? 2 oxaloacetate to restore that. Oh, fumarate, by the way, is a 4 carbon molecule. All right, reaction 7. From fumarate to malate. And this is catalyzed by an enzyme called fumarase. And nothing special happens in that reaction, except for it to convert fumarate into malate that is also a 4-carbon molecule. Oh, this is actually an okay circle. It just got kind of, it got bent in a little bit here. It's like a pumpkin. It's like a pumpkin shape. Yeah, it's like a bean. Or bean. What kind of pumpkins do I have? The best pumpkins. Those pop those, oh, no. <laughs> those pop, you don't know nothing about those Pondo pumpkins. Those things grow up in the streets, right? Those are hard pumpkins. <laughs> All right, reaction eight converts malate into oxaloacetate, which is also a four carbon molecule. And it is facilitated by an enzyme called what do we still need to make? Somebody tell me what we're missing. Some for, well, we, we need to make oxaloacetate, but we've made we two, our four... Well, uh, I mean, that's going to happen... That's, that's going to happen as part of this as well. So, uh, the that's a good call. At the beginning? Yep. So well, it's, it's the end, but it's also the beginning. That's like that Black Eyed Peas song. Well, that's why we represent it with a circle, right? The end of a circle is also the beginning of a circle, because there really is no beginning and no end to a circle, right? It's a circle. Yeah, Mark? Don't we, we, need, don't we need to make one more NADH? We do. Good call. Yeah, because we need to make six NADH. We've made two here. We made two here. That's four. We need to make two more. And what kinds of enzymes facilitate reactions where we make NADH, Mark? Um, dehydrogenase oh. reactions. And what do you think this enzyme's called, Tori? I was gonna... I knew you were gonna say dehydrogenase, but what do you think this enzyme is called? What is it, what's, what's it starting with? No, that's what it ends with, exaloacetate. What's it start? So what do you think the enzyme's called? Malate dehydrogenase. Malate dehydrogenase. And that's how I remember these, because they make sense, right? Yeah. Once you know what a dehydrogenase enzyme is, it makes sense what the name of this enzyme should be. And yes, Mark, we are going to make our final set of NADH. NADH. And we make it from two molecules of NAD+. And now... Ladies and gentlemen, we have finished the Krebs cycle, 
and we have accounted for the four carbon dioxide we know are made during the Krebs cycle, the two coenzymes A that are made during the Krebs cycle so we can use them in future rounds of pyruvate oxidation. We've accounted for the two, four, six molecules of NADH we know we make during the Krebs cycle. We've accounted for the two ATP we know we make during the Krebs cycle. And we've accounted for the two FADH2 that we know we make during the Krebs cycle. Trinity. Did you forget the twos on like all of the stuff on the Oh, yeah. All of these have twos. Oh, my God. Oh, that's Man, Trinity, you were dialed in. You knew those twos were there the whole time, didn't you? And you know I was leaving it out time after time. And you didn't want to point it out here, or here, or here, or here. You wanted to wait until all the way at the end and say, Dr. Engel, I think you might be missing not one, not two, but five twos up on the board. Three. What did he, did he get one four. in Miami? Or did he get two? I got two. Two? Right? I know he lost to Dallas in one of them, and that was horrific. That's tough. It, <laughs> that, that way you're, you're able to get, get to cover all of that, all of them in one fell swoop. All the two Absolutely. Ones. All of those, That's you are right about that. Trinity did help me out there. I got to just write all the twos in at once. Yeah, because what if you would have forgot afterwards? Like, you would have put the twos, and like, by the end you would have forgot again, and you would have been told twice. So I know. Like, Emma, do, do you have a question? No, I'm just thinking. You're just thinking. There's a lot to think about with this, with this Krebs cycle 2.0. Hey, don't you worry. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation 2.0, it's, it's very simple compared to this. Very simple. I, you don't trust me, but I'm, I'm telling you, compared to this, it's very simple. This, this is fewer reactions than glycolysis, but there's more going on. There are more side reactions happening. So this is probably more complicated than glycolysis 2.0, but I'm going to tell you oxidative phosphorylation 2.0, much, much simpler. Uh, Issa and, and Emma. Hey, hey, shh. Issa's confused, and she's not going to be able to ask her question with Rick with an H talking. Yeah. Did you know that he spells his name Rick with an H? Yeah, it's got a K, it's got a K and an H. It's R I C K H. <laughs> yeah, that's true, guys. It's my deepest secret. Okay. Well, what do you got, Isa? You start with two acetyl coate. Yes. And you, two oxalate. Yes. Yeah, because we're at the end of the Krebs cycle, we restore the two oxaloacetate. And then those two molecules of oxaloacetate are involved in the first reaction of the Krebs cycle. It's where those acetyl-CoA molecules come and attach, one to each exaloacetate, and then it can run through this cycle, restoring the exaloacetate needed to do reaction one over again. So what kind of questions are you going to ask us about this? Uh, I'm not going to ask you any questions about this. It's the, the question is, what kind of questions are the people who write the AP exams oh, but going to ask us? Well, you, from our exams from now on, I'm just pulling old AP exams. And so what kinds of questions are they going to ask you? Usually they're going to ask you big picture type questions. Like something, you might, you might see a question like this. Let's suppose somebody had a mutation in the gene that codes for isocitrate dehydrogenase. Okay? So they give you a question like this. Somebody's got a mutation in the gene that codes for isocitrate dehydrogenase. And then they might ask you, what process would be inhibited in that person? What? So if they have a mutation in the gene that codes for this, they can't make this protein. If you can't make this protein, you cannot do reaction three. If you can't do reaction three, you certainly can't do four through eight because there's no alpha ketoglutamate. Right? Yeah. So they might ask you a question like that. Um, How would you answer that? Well, they'd give you like a multiple choice. And they would say, what would be inhibited? And so then they might ask you, you know, it, it, are they going to be able to do glycolysis? Right? And if they can't make this enzyme, will they be able to do glycolysis? No. 
Yes. I mean, oh. this this has no bearing on glycolysis. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Or then, then or the, is the Krebs cycle going to be inhibited? Oh, means it can't happen. Yeah, if you can't do reaction three, you can't do the Krebs cycle. I mean, you can do the first two reactions, but that doesn't do you any good, yeah. other than building up a whole bunch of isocitrate. What do you can do with that? I have no idea. Okay. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that would be the kind of question that I would put on there, but I would say that, and I think most of you would agree with this, that I write questions that are more difficult than what most of the yeah. writers on the AP That's exam write. So, yeah. I so they might write, uh, yeah, I mean, they probably wouldn't ask anything that specific. They would ask something more general and say, if the Krebs cycle were inhibited, what would that mean as far as the amount of ATP you could produce per glucose molecule? Right, so then you're right off the bat, you didn't have to remember this specific enzyme. You're like, if you can't do the Krebs cycle, all you can do is glycolysis, mm -hmm. which means the most you can get is two ATP out of a glucose molecule instead oh, yeah. of the 32 like to 34. Two, right? yeah. Well, we got two more, but then we also make six molecules of NADH that are worth two and a half ATP each. So that's another 15. And we make two FADH2 that are worth one and a half ATP each for another three. Yes. I mean, it's worth more and more ATP as long as you can finish the process. Absolutely. Yep. And, and, and basically, everything is assessed in its amount of ATP. Why? Because that's the, that's the currency of the, of the cell. Yeah. Just like everything, we assess its value in dollars, right? Even like what is, what, what is the life of my dog worth, right? Which you have to assess that if somebody kills your dog and you sue them, right? They have to have what is, what's the value of the life of a dog? Yeah, what is the value of a dog? Well, it depends on the dog. Like, so if somebody killed your dog and the dog's a breeding dog, and every time it has a litter of pups, those litter of pups are worth $20,000. That dog's got a lot of value in dollar bills. And then other than that, it's just like, I know, what is the jury going to feel like a dog is worth for my emotional well-being? You know? It's a lot. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, I always had a dog growing up, but I haven't had a dog in over 10 years. And I got one like two two weeks ago. And man, I love him. I love him. Do you have pictures? I do. His name is Zero. Oh, yeah. Alright, I'm gonna erase this. Uh, pause. You wanna see a picture of my dog? That's not a question. Oh, okay. No, no, don't erase it. Okay, don't erase I have it yet. Two so I don't understand what Oh yeah, we didn't even get I'm yeah. sorry. We I'm so sorry. I knew you had a question. Um, so where does the two COA come from at the, at the beginning? Oh, so the two COA came from here. So acetyl CoA brought those coenzyme A, and then during the uh, Krebs cycle, those CoA enzymes are released that can be used in pyruvate oxidation over again. Because both the Krebs cycle and pyruvate oxidation take place where? Inside of the mitochondrion. So if the coenzymes A are released here, they're free to be used in pyruvate oxidation. Wait, what does it do? Like, what, why, what the coenzyme A? No, the Krebs cycle, like, what does it essentially do for the what does it do for the cell? It produces ATP and facilitates the oxidation of those carbon atoms so to generate more energy. I mean, that's why the Krebs cycle exists to generate energy. What about glycose? Glycolysis? It exists to generate energy for the cells. All of these are energy. They, they would be analogous to our digestive system. They, they are taking something, they are processing it to release energy. All right? Now can I erase this? Yeah. yeah. Alright. Cool. You're gonna like you're gonna like Oxyphos 2.0. Whisper, whisper, whisper. Secrets. Secrets. Do you hear what I was saying? Huh? Do you hear what I was saying? Do I want to hear what you were saying? I don't think I'm emotionally mature enough. I was, to hear what you're I was saying. just, Issa was like, hey, I like your windbreaker. I was like, hey, I stole it from my brother. Thanks. But your brother's 
Your brother graduated. Yeah. What? He doesn't need his Trinity Windbreaker anymore. I know, but this was his favorite jacket. He wore everything. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I would call that stealing. I'd he call that more me. repurposing. He thought, it, he thought it was too small, and Just, then he tried oh. it on again a year after I had it, and he wanted to take it back by one month. Yeah, and you're like, dude, you already repurposed this. Yeah, it so belongs sorry. to me now. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So Oxyfoss 2.0. Here it is. You're going to like this. You're going to like this. Oh, we are? Yes. What is this? What is this? Oxyfos 2.0. Oxidative phosphorylation. Do you think I should start on a new page? Like, tell me your honest opinion. Look at my page. Oh, you're going to have plenty of room. Yeah. Is this enough space? I don't want to sign it. Depends on how big you're writing. Anything could be enough space to write. That's how much space you need. I'm going to fit, I'm going to write some things in the margins, but this is how much space you need. I know, I had to to get my circle. Here. So it's called oxidation. Oxidative phosphorylation. Abbreviated oxyphos. Wow, now I can't think. Photosynthesis. Thank you. Wait, how do you spell oxidative what? Oxidative phosphorylation. And we call this um, oxidative phosphorylation to distinguish it from other types of phosphorylation. And all of those dehydrogenase reactions, they're carrying out phosphorylation reactions. Yes. Well, not all of them, some of them. Most of them are carrying out just redox reactions. Man, was anybody frustrated that we didn't call succinyl-CoA synthetase no. a kinase enzyme? I know, but they don't. That's that's not part of its name. It should be. Gosh, now I'm really mad about that. I was just a little bit mad because synthetase makes me feel like I'm making succinyl CoA, where really you were using it. But it should be a kinase. Gosh, the name of that enzyme should be succinyl CoA kinase. It should be. You're right. We should. write a letter. We should write a letter. I don't even know who. I don't. That's a wonderful question. I don't know. The person. The person <laughs> you know what you do is you just start calling the enzyme something else, and then if you get enough people sharing that opinion, that's it's true. just like now that becomes the name for it. Like Wikipedia. Yeah. Sort of like Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Have you ever seen the book of Joe's Fringle? They, I they, haven't. They, that is exactly what happens. Where a kid calls a pen a fringle. A fringle. And then, uh, no, a frindle. A frindle. And then, and, and then, it, like that word becomes popular enough so that, it, like, so that the dictionary ends up changing pen to frindle. I went to grad school with a guy that coined a term, and it is a good term. Right. It's volnungent. And what it means is an animal that spits its venom. Why would you ever need? Yes. Volnungent. Because <laughs> that's catchy, isn't it? It is. No, so if you've not. got, so some snakes spit their venom, yeah. like they don't just inject it when they bite, but they'll spit it, and like so Jackie? they they are volnungent. Hey, Rick, are you doing like you you are. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I told you I would draw on the margins. What does this look like here? Uh, well, here, let me let me make that continuous. What does this line look like? It is a membrane. It does look like the membrane. You are so right, Katie. And specifically, you guys are missing good information, having your little conversations. Inner mitochondrial membrane. Yep, inner mitochondrial membrane. Are you getting me right above this or just below it? Um, I am just going to be writing beneath it. I'm not going to write above it. I, except for I'll have a little bit of an error, arrow. Do, you don't like the Roman numerals? Who had a problem with the Roman no, numerals? I was just wondering how much space you should put in between. In between these complexes? You don't need much. I'm only going to write like maybe five more things and then we're going to be done with Oxyfos 2.0. All right. So, Kyle, in the electron transport chain, what gets transported? Electrons. Electrons, right? And where do those electrons come from? From our electron carriers, which are Lydia, NADH, and FADH2. 
Okay? The difference is the reason why the reason why FADH2 is worth fewer ATP than NADH is is because it gives its electrons to a different complex. So NADH NADH gives its electrons here. NADH gives its electrons to complex 1. Yes, complex 1. FADH2 gives its electrons to complex 2. That would make sense. Okay, hold up, hold up. What is this called? Oxid Oxidative phosphorylation. phosphorylation. And this is the membrane we're talking about? This is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Oh, my, okay. Yep. And what is 1, 2, 3, 4? Complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4. And what do they do? They're proteins. You'll see what they do in just a minute. So one thing is they participate in transferring electrons. Okay. And then another thing that they do is participate in pumping hydrogen ions. So they're like little pumps. Pumped! <laughs> Pumped! <laughs> Pumped! Was it the protein pump? Yeah, we Is the second one pumped? Oh, they're all pumped. Pumped. And if they are pumped, what do you think of? What do I think of pumped? If they are pumped, it means that as far as across a membrane goes, what does a pump do? It's not a channel, right? A channel's just a channel's like a, a tunnel for water to run through. But what does a pump do? Why do you when, when would you need a pump for water? When you need like so when push it's not it going through with naturally. force. When you need to push it through with force and it's not going the way water wants to move. I don't know if you knew this or not, but water flows downhill. Whoa. That's true. Yeah. Wait, really? Yeah, it's why That's the how gravity it's works. why I don't know if you knew this or not, but the tube that takes water away from your toilet has a downward slope. Because if it had an upward slope, <laughs> you'd have to pump the water out. And that would not be good, because then if you lost electricity, you couldn't flush your toilet. And if you can't flush your toilet, that's disgusting. Then we're, we're basically animals. We are animals. What do we do? So these hydrogen ions are being pumped. They're being forced to go somewhere they don't want to go. Which means they're being forced to go somewhere where there is what? Oh, more a lot. Hydrogen. A lot of hydrogen ions. Just a ton of them. So I don't, I'm not going to draw anything above here because I told Rick I wouldn't. So I'm going to draw it right here, still above this membrane, and I'm going to put a lot. There are a lot of hydrogen ions. Wait, the second one up here. Pumping it, or they all are? No, the second one is not. So since FADH gives its electrons here, there's one fewer pump its electrons get to participate in. Wait, is this like a little pattern, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three? Yeah, yes. Well, actually, it goes one, three, four, or two, three, four. No, it does go. It goes one, two, three, four, or All two, three, four. Wait. Yeah. Uh, so the electrons either go one, two, three, four if they came from NADH. Uh, if they come from FADH two, they only go two, three, four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, you know what? I I. I've been there. <laughs> oh, like, really? uh, yeah, I know. I've never. I I crushed this finger one time, and my 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 nail just totally fell off. It was super gross. So it was way worse than losing an acrylic. Because at least when you lose your acrylic, there's your normal nail underneath, right? All right. Okay. So does this make sense? And then what are transported in this, Kyle? Electrons, so if the electrons are given here, the electrons will go, and they're just, they're just on a ride here. They're just on a ride uh, here. not working for me. I don't like Why isn't that working for you? That's beautiful. And then what acts as the final electron acceptor? <laughs> you do, you love it. What is the final electron acceptor? So you see these electrons are bouncing. They're just bouncing, and then ultimately they bounce all the way down to uh, hydrogen or something. Those are electrons? I'm just going to make a note of that. Bouncing? 
Oxygen. Those are electrons bouncing. Here, let me let me put this little. There you go. Just so you know that that bouncing, those are electrons because the it's the electron transport chain. Hey, and don't don't hate the bouncing. Okay, embrace it. I mean, if you want to make it look better on your paper, feel free, but embrace the bouncing. Okay, and then the final electron acceptor is oxygen. And when it takes those electrons, it also takes on some hydrogens, and it forms water. Which just makes sense, because what is one of our reactants in cellular respiration? Water. No, that's a product. Oxygen. Oxygen. Water. And water is a product. I, yeah. Although water is also a reactant, but you use way less water than you produce, so overall we only list it as a product. Wait, what's that little uh, hill thing? Oh, the hill oxygen, thing? Oxygen, oxygen. The hills and valleys? Those are the electrons going through the electron transport chain. Okay, and what's the... the ends of it ends with oxygen. Oxygen is what's called the final... We'll put this in parentheses. The final so it's electron acceptor. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. If oxygen is not present, this will not happen. If oxygen isn't present to be the final, basically oxygen is pulling electrons down this chain. So if oxygen isn't there to provide that tug, the electrons don't, they don't even move from NADH to complex one or from FADH2 to complex two. They just stay in NADH unless they can go then to be tacked onto pyruvate to form lactate, right? You got fermentation. Katie and then Carrie. Does H plus go through the compound two? Go through the, yes, it gets pumped through these complexes. All of them? Not two. Not One, three, and four. Okay. And that's why FADH2 produces fewer ATP than NADH because it pumps fewer hydrogen. Okay. Right? Final Wait, I thought you said that if you start with NADH, then it goes through all four. It does. Then it goes through. Two, three, and four. So it misses one. Yeah. And one is yeah. where we get some hydrogen pumping happening. The hydrogen get pumped through. It does. It gets, it gets pumped through, not through it's two. No, two does not pump any hydrogen, only one, three, and four. So if FADH skips one, it doesn't pump as many hydrogen. It still pumps hydrogen, but not as many. Oh, okay. And that's why it's worth fewer ATP. So could it go through one FADH or not? No, not at all. So not at all. Yeah. Okay. okay, and then from your previous, from your previous diagram, that works. From your previous diagram of the electron transport chain, you know that if you're pumping hydrogens and you have a whole bunch here, they're going to want to diffuse, right? And where do they diffuse through? You have that in your previous diagram. They diffuse through a separate complex altogether called what? Well, through a process of chemiosmosis, but what's the complex? It's there. It's called ATP synthase. Do you see it there, Emma? Oh, yeah. Boom, it's there. So they, di they diffuse down through a process called chemiosmosis through a complex called ATP synthase and make ATP. But we're not going to do that again. This is now, we're done with OxyFos 2.0. Way better than the Krebs cycle 2.0, right? I told you this is a lot simpler. It's not, it's not easy. It's simpler. Life is not easy. You are so, so right. All right. I'm going to pause our recording. We are, all right. Recording has started back. All right, so in your five minutes of working with others around you, I know some of you came up with the formula what? for photosynthesis. What is the chemical reaction, the big picture chemical reaction of photosynthesis, just like we have a big picture uh, chemical reaction of cellular respiration? Tori. It's like 6 C... Two, CO2 plus 12... 6 O... o H2O plus my equals 12. <laughs> <laughs> plus my equals 12. <laughs> 6O2 plus 
Does this reaction look familiar? Yeah, it's the yeah, opposite. Of it's the exact opposite of cellular respiration. Wow. In cellular respiration, we take a sugar, we oxidize it to produce carbon dioxide and water. In photosynthesis, a plant takes carbon dioxide and water and reduces that carbon dioxide to make sugar. And that's why I told you that carbon dioxide is gone, but those trees, they're just going to drink it up. Although you can't really do that anymore because now straws are illegal in the state of California. Wait, so the, you've got the, 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 plas the plastic yeah. straws. So you have to like, well, request them. Yeah. You have to request them. If they get... If they give one to you and you didn't request it, you need to turn that server in so that they can be fined. Oh, shoot. No. Whoa. Because it's a... Oh, shoot. Both, Wait, so why does everybody just get paper straws? Both the, paper, both the Starbucks the and the server are subject to like legal action, that. including a fine up to $10,000. No. And you're like, my barista, this is like some poor college student. I'm turning you in. <laughs> Good luck like paying that fine. Starbucks Mark. No, this is not 2.0, this is 1.0. This is 10. Hey, Mark's asking a question and you guys are talking. I can't I'm even so hear. Sorry. You're like my children. I am yeah. Like, like, I am very interested in this word that your that your friend like, like pitched. So I'm I am i Oh Volnungent. Volnungent. Can yeah. you spell that out for me? I'm yeah, it's V it's V U L V U L N U N N U N G E N T. Volnungent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's again it's it's the exact opposite reaction that what we from what we saw in cellular respiration. Where did the plants get the carbon dioxide? From the air that we from the atmosphere, right? There's plenty of it in there. Even if we weren't exhaling a ton of carbon dioxide. There's plenty of carbon dioxide in the air because it's produced as the plants carry out cellular respiration. Okay? So the plants get carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Where do they get water? The rain. From the rain? Mostly from groundwater here because it doesn't rain enough to actually make it dependable. According to Tori, it's raining today. It is raining. It's not. It's not raining right now. So Tori is wrong. If that was Tori's not wrong. Tori's wrong. It's Tori. All right, and then it's probably yeah. Sweet. And then look at this. Look at this. The cell makes it, or the plant makes its own oxygen that it needs to carry out cellular respiration. Wait, that's weird. So how does that work? But it makes way more than it needs, so that we have enough oxygen to carry out our cellular that's respiration. So it's so thoughtful. <laughs> okay, we've got Emma, then Mark, then Isa. Emma. So I don't know if it's like stupid, but if it doesn't rain for like if we're in a drought, right? Where does the groundwater come from? Uh, the groundwater comes from a, a number of places. One is it's is almost always there, but our groundwater comes mostly from snow melt up in the Sierras. So that you'll get these mountain springs, and then they'll go to a place where they go underground, and they'll 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 provide the, the groundwater. But some of it also comes from uh, the the ocean backing back up into the groundwater. So you've got like this whole water table situation going on. Mark. Um, I would like sure there are like there's, there's, there's like like not not necessarily multiple reactions, but like. There's like a reaction of like that, like that, like there's like a process that plants go through. Basically, there that that's like only during the day. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And then there's also one that happens both day and night. You are certainly correct, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. A lot about that on Friday, Isa. Um, can you, wait, what were you saying before you were asking the questions? What was I saying before I was asking the questions? Oh, that the plants produce oxygen in the process of photosynthesis, oxygen that they need to carry out cellular respiration. But luckily for us, luckily. the per day, luckily, yeah, you're good. That, that's fine. Yeah. You you're laughing because I said it slow okay. and carefully and enunciated all of my syllables. Yeah, I can't do that when you're saying okay. low. So, yeah. 
They, luckily for us, they produce way more oxygen and photosynthesis than they need for cellular respiration. And so a ton of oxygen leaves the plant tissues into the atmosphere, providing us oxygen for us to inhale and to use for our cellular respiration. Okay, so the question was, if plants that exist and is there no oxygen? Uh, there are other photosynthesizers. Even if plants didn't exist, we would probably get, you'd probably get enough oxygen being produced by like the uh, photoautotrophs in the ocean and in lakes and in rivers. We'd be in trouble here. I mean, we're close to the ocean, but we don't really have any big bodies of fresh water that have a lot of uh, primary production going on. We'd be in trouble here. Yeah, Emma. Yeah, this is kind of off topic. Okay, I love it. Okay, so how do they make paper out of trees? Yeah. Oh, they take uh, they take the really... the lignin, which is uh, in in plant cell walls, <clears throat> and they use that to make paper. I mean, they basically they take the bark or like parts of the the tree that are too small to use to to make wood products that are of any value, and they grind it up, and then they, they sheet it out in the paper. And then they bleach it to get to make it white. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it comes like brown. I mean, it's because it came from a tree. I mean, it's like a light brown, but then they have to bleach it to make it white. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what do you need, what do you need to have fire? So remember, fire is a combustion reaction. You, you don't need CO2, you're going to make it. You need oxygen, right? Yeah. Because fire is a combustion reaction, so is cellular respiration. But cellular respiration happens slowly, fire happens very quickly. Okay? Photosynthesis produces oxygen. And so I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's kind of cool. So if you have a candle and you put the lid on, eventually the candle goes out, right? Because it, you run out of oxygen in there. But if you put a plant in there and it's in the sunlight and you put the lid back on, the fire will keep going because the plant in sunlight produces enough oxygen to keep the fire going. Uh, I mean, you, you, you could try it with a leaf, but I would put like, you know, you could buy like a small potted plant. Uh, you could probably put a succulent, let me see. So the succulents are going to do the second part, Mark, only at night, but that's the second part, the light independent, that does not produce oxygen. Yeah, the succulent would probably work. Yeah, I think so, as long as I had enough surface area for photosynthesis. But it's kind of cool. I did this when I did my demo for here, for them to figure out whether they wanted me to teach the AP Bio class or someone else. I came and I taught the freshman biology class. And, and, and I did this, this demonstration that if you put a plant in the jar and you close it, the fire keeps going because the plant's producing enough oxygen to feed the fire. Anyways, all right. So during, during this reaction, carbon moves to this sugar molecule, and during that process, it gets reduced. Wait, wait what gets reduced? The carbon. So the carbon moves from carbon dioxide over into this sugar molecule, and during that process, it gets reduced. What does reduction mean? It gains electrons. It gains electrons. Because in carbon dioxide, and this is one where, where I, remember I told you you can lose without really losing? Yeah. This is it's gaining without really gaining. Mm -hmm. This carbon at any given time has the eight valence electrons it wants because it's sharing them with these oxygens. But we know oxygen is an electron hog, right? We've talked about this. So this carbon is sharing the electrons with the oxygen, but it's getting very little of that, right? The, the carbon's definitely the younger brother in this relationship. But check out what happens when carbon goes over here. Some of these carbons are bonded to oxygens, but some of the bonds are with hydrogen. And it shares a lot more evenly with the hydrogen. They're like fraternal twin brothers, okay? It's a much even sharing. They can't be identical because it's hydrogen, it's not carbon, but they're fraternal. Naturally. At about the same size. Although it always works out that fraternal twins, one of them's huge and the other one's tiny. I don't know why that works out that way. Do you know any fraternal twins? I mean, where, where both of them are the same same sex. Is one huge and one tiny? Really? 
I feel oh, like in all of my relationships, one. every fraternal oh, set of twins that I know that they're the same sex, one of them's huge, the other one's yeah. tiny. Oh, yeah, yeah. So fraternal twins, one of them is like a ginger with freckles, and the other one is like brown hair, dark skin, and like a really Love it. And the other one is like really fair. It's so yeah, it's wonderful. So I have one set of friends that are fraternal twins, two girls. One of them is six feet. No, and the other one is five oh, yeah. feet. Oh. No joke, they are one foot different in height. So does, does she play volleyball? And you know which one was born first? The little one. Oh man, it's so perfect. All right. So carbon gets reduced during this process. In cellular respiration, what happened to the carbon? It wasn't being reduced, it was being oxidized. Because we were doing the reverse process, we were taking electrons away from it. But in photosynthesis, electrons are packed onto it. It's so beautiful. All right. Okay. So all of these oxygens from water go into this here. <laughs> No, that's not true. Some of them go over here. So you're drawing two arrows? Yep, drawing two arrows. All of these oxygens from carbon dioxide go here. Some of the oxygen from the water goes into producing oxygen. Some of those oxygens go over into here. And then all of these oxygens go over here. And then all of the hydrogens go over here. Don't worry about numbers because there are other things involved as well. You're like, that doesn't make any sense because there are six oxygen here. How can some of them go here and then some still go here to produce six? That doesn't make sense. There, there don't seem to be enough to go around. You don't need to worry about that because it all it all works. It all works. It all works. All right, so here is our reaction for photosynthesis, and here's where the different elements go. And if you were to design an experiment, and you were, you were wondering, you're like, okay, how do I figure out where this oxygen goes? How would you do it? You mark it. Somehow. You mark it somehow. Mark and so how could you do that? You, you can, because there are different types of oxygen, right? There are different, oh, just like there are different types of carbon. There's carbon-12, the there's carbon-13, there's carbon-14. Some of them have different numbers of neutrons. So what if you did this? What if you took carbon dioxide, because you can control where your plant gets the carbon dioxide, right? You, you grow it in a lab, and you give it the carbon dioxide you want to give it. What if you gave it carbon dioxide that all of the oxygen it had wasn't the typical oxygen, which is oxygen-16, but instead was the atypical oxygen 18. And then you can trace to where that oxygen went by weighing these out and figuring out which one has the heavy oxygen. This is beautiful. Anyways, that's bonus information for you. You don't have to worry about paying for it. It's a gift. No, but you're paying, you're paying for what you need, not for what I'm giving you. Right? So generous. Yeah. Okay. How many? $83. $83? Gosh, that's a bargain. Do you know how much college costs? <laughs> Way more than that. Way more than $83 a day. In Europe, it's free. In Europe? No, not in every country. And even in the countries where it's free, it's not really free. Nothing's ever. Nothing's really free, Emma. You, you, we, we got to do a little bit of we got to do a little bit of fact checking if we want to we want to talk about how you're actually paying for that because the thing is if if you've got a job in most European countries your tax rates like forty to sixty percent. I think all the Europeans come to our schools. So it's like you're paying for it. You're just gonna pay for it for the rest of your life instead of at the beginning. Yeah. All right. Anyways. So it's like so cool. Like think about this. Like you're like you know what? You know what? I I want to live in Paris, right? And so you're like I've got this sweet job offer from Paris where I'm going to make the equivalent of $120,000 a year. And then you don't think 
man, the tax rate in Paris, it's like 40%. Is it really? So I'm only going to really actually make the equivalent of 80000 plus then there are going to be all these other... Anyways. Oh, gosh, the tax rates are super high in most European countries. Wait, it's, so what if you live there for like three months? It's still going to take 40%? Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, they get do their you, money. Do, do you think governments care how long you live in their country? No, nah, man, they're going to get... Anyways, all right, this is another story for another time. Okay, so back up here. Shh. So this is big picture. Big picture. Just like in cellular respiration, there were multiple processes. In photosynthesis, there are multiple processes. But there are only two. And they're very easy to remember. We have the light dependent. We have the light dependent processes. And what do you think the other process is? Mark. Light independent. Not only was that great critical thinking, Mark, it was efficient, clear, and it was it was just it was heartfelt. I love it. Light independent. And what does light dependent mean? Mark, it requires sunlight. Requires sunlight. Requires sunlight. And then we're going to go, and just like we did for cellular respiration, we're going to go, what are the major things used? What are the major things produced? So it requires sunlight, meaning it's going to use sunlight, right? That's what requires sunlight means, right? Okay. It also requires water. And what does that mean? It, it, need, it, it needs water. It means water is going to be a reactant. But look at this. Water is a reactant. Okay, so it requires sunlight. It requires water. And here's what it produces. Yeah, Isa. Seattle, or like what Alaska's dark for Well, if you can see, there's sunlight, yeah. right? So you, you're right about Alaska. Um, in, in those high areas, you, you have a typical biome there is either uh, taiga or what is, what's the other name for it? Boreal forest, or there's tundra. And the plants, the plants there, uh, you don't find in, in, the, in the taiga, or the boreal forest, you do find some really big pine trees, um, but they aren't known for their incredible photosynthetic output, and especially not in the tundra. Yeah. So the answer to your question is: during the winter, they just they don't photosynthesize um, as much. But I mean, even in the winter, I don't think there's. I'm trying to think of. There might be one day a year at the North Pole where the sun never comes up, but that's that's unusual. I mean, you usually still get like a good eight to ten hours of sunlight. All right, Emma, and then Mark, and then Katie. Um, do you know how many days it rains in Antarctica? Uh, I don't, but not much, because they don't get a ton of precipitation. Big L snow. Do you know, I was looking this up. I've been looking at different places because, you know, it's been raining here and I was curious, like, what are the average number of days that we have precipitation here compared to other places that I lived? And so do you know the average number of days here 20. in Santa Clarita? It's 20. Is it really? 20 days a year on average that we have some form of precipitation. That is so bad. 20. You know where I lived in o where I lived in Ohio, do you know the average number of days? 97. I was going to say 83. 97 average number of days that we had precipitation. Wow. What about Seattle? Um, <laughs> Seattle, I think, I think they, I think they have fewer than a hundred days of sunshine in Seattle every year. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure they have fewer than a hundred days of sunshine, but that doesn't mean that they have fewer than a hundred days of no rain. They, they probably have. I would guess that they're probably somewhere between like 150 and 170 days of precipitation. Uh, probably, but I don't know if it's 
all because of the weather. The Mariners, they're terrible. The Supersonics, they were so bad they left and went to Oklahoma City. The Seahawks, they're pretty good. Mark. At home, though. Mark's asking a question, and again, every time Mark's asked a question... You guys, it's chattering. This happened before. I'm used to it. Before. Mark, what do you got for us? Like, um, so this, this is for the purpose of, of other people's knowledge. What would happen under, under the ocean where it's dark? Uh, no photosynthesis happens beyond a depth of about, what is it? But then there's the plants down there. Like, like, the, like, the plants it's there. beyond a depth of, I think it's 200 meters. There's no photosynthesis. No, I think you get some photosynthesis up to about, maybe it's, maybe it's up to about a thousand meters, but you have very little beyond 200 meters. You have a different type of, you have a different type of producer. You have chemi autotrophs. Hydrothermal vents. Yep. All right, Katie. Okay. So my cousins live in Alaska. Okay. During the winter. They go to school when it's dark, and it's light during recess, and then they go back inside, and it's dark when they come out for lunch. Like, yeah. But then in the summertime, like, when you you get, summer, you get like, 18 or 19 hours of sunlight. It's light until, like, midnight, and mm-hmm. then the sun goes down for two hours and comes yeah. out. I know, so you could be out grilling at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning. You've I got know, a block party. That's I mean, funny. It's just, well, yeah. My parents didn't sleep, like, the entire time yeah, we were there because they felt, like... It's weird because you feel bad about going to sleep when the sun's still up, even though it's like midnight. Yeah. I'm wasting it. I get it. All right, so it requires sunlight. It requires water. The question is, what does it produce? And the answer to that is it produces ATP, and it produces NADPH. Okay? It produces ATP. And it produces NADPH. So sunlight. So it requires sunlight. It requires water. Notice what it did not require. What's another reactant of photosynthesis? Uh, glucose. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Glucose is a product. Oh, sorry, sorry. Now it also. Oh gosh, it's one more thing. Produces O2. So it produces ATP. It produces oxygen, and it produces NADPH. What about the sugar? Does this look similar to anything we saw in oh. cellular respiration? Yeah. Looks a little bit like NADH. And if you were to give a title to what NADH is, what would that title be? It is an electron carrier. So what do you think this is? Uh, this is an electron carrier. It, uh, it is also a giver. All carriers are givers, right? Because they carry Because they're carriers. It's like the mail carrier. It's a, it's, they, they carry the mail, but then they give it. All right. So, but what did we not require? Uh, what? Carbon dioxide, which means what is this going to require? Carbon dioxide. Oh, critical thinking at its finest. Requires <laughs> carbon dioxide. And now we've accounted for both of our reactants, and that's all this requires. I mean, it, you know, there's there are some cycles because you could argue the Krebs cycle requires exaloacetate, <coughs> but it makes exaloacetate, right? Yeah. So this does require other molecules, but it makes those molecules, and it's called the Calvin Benson cycle. But we'll talk about that on Friday when we go through this in more detail. But what have we not made? We haven't made sugar, right? And so that's what's going to be made during the light independent parts of photosynthesis. We are going to make our sugar. So here's where we make our oxygen. Here's where we make our sugar. Here's where we require our water. Here's where we require our carbon dioxide. We've accounted for all of the reactants and all of the products of photosynthesis in an overview of this process. Okay? There's only one more piece of information I need you to know today before we do photosynthesis 2.0 on Friday. Oh, shoot. And that's where do they happen? Chloroplasts. The light, they, all, all of these happen inside of the chloroplast, but specifically, the light-dependent reactions happen in the inner 
membrane of the chloroplast. And specifically, that membrane is called, do you remember this, anyone? Chlorophyll. Starts with a TH and rhymes with... <laughs> I'm sorry. Thylakoid. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. I don't remember that. Thylakoid membrane. And then this is within the chloroplast, inner membrane of the chloroplast. The light independent reactions also take place in the chloroplast, but they take place in the stroma that I remember. of the chloroplast. The what? The stroma. The fluid of the chloroplast. So here, let's let's do that. The fluid. When you look at a, at a chloroplast, it looks a little bit like a leprechaun's best dream. Because it looks like you've got stacks of coins filling up the chloroplast. But what those stacks are, are really stacks of thylakoid membrane, packing in an enormous amount of machinery to carry out the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. Yeah, Mark. Um, you misspelled chloroplast on the light-dependent. Oh my goodness. Thank you. All right. Any questions? This is photosynthesis 1.0. We got exactly to the point I wanted to get in our class today, and we've got five minutes left. Yeah. We're pretty close. And so, presenting an option. We've had options before. And we'll see if Rick forces my hand on this one. So I've got, I've got an option for you. Do you want to, A, me give you maybe some... some Good morning, upper school. I apologize. Uh, but we do need to stay inside. It is raining rain. right now. We do need to stay rain. inside. Rain. 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 Okay. Do you want to, A, work on some questions that I can come up with from photosynthesis one, or would you like to be begin photosynthesis 2.0? No, question. Question. By a show of hands, left hand is A, right hand is B. A is, I'll give you, I'll, we'll ask a couple of questions here and we'll finish our time that way. Or B, we'll do photosynthesis 2.0. A by left hand, B is it's ours. All right. A, a carries. Okay. So we've got... Motion carries. All right. A few questions. Hey, and, and the recording is going. Did you have another question or are you still holding your vote for it? Okay. So uh, the, the recording's still going. So the questions and the answers to these questions will be picked up. All right. So what I want to ask you is this. What happens to this sugar that is made during this process of photosynthesis. And I will give you a hint that its fate is very similar to the oxygen made during photosynthesis. Mark. Now that you mentioned like, it's like, like the last part, I don't know. Okay. Like, like, I'll, yeah, so, so what do you got for us? What happens um, to the sugar that is made during photosynthesis? Like my guess is, like, is that it is, like, it's, like, I see it's used as food for the plant. It is. Just like the plant uses the oxygen that it makes for cellular respiration, it also uses the sugar it makes for cellular respiration, but... Just like luckily the plant makes more oxygen than it needs, it makes more sugar than it needs, which means it stores it up. It stores up excess sugar, which is what provides fuel for animals that eat plants. Okay, because if it used everything that it made, eating a plant would be literally <coughs> pointless. It actually would be worse than pointless because you use energy to chew and so it would be worse than pointless. Wow. Yep. All right, you guys have to stay in here during brunch. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to leave? No, I have nowhere to go. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll hang out.